subscription just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with Tom. Tom, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> don't get ahead. Don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> know your place, co-host. No, I'm Damn. kidding. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, how have you been? Not too bad. I mean, it, it is a busy time of year. Uh, it's hard to believe we're. But by the time this releases, uh, school will be in session for pretty much almost everybody. Yes, yes. I'm already seeing a lot of people uh, getting their kids back to school, back to high school. Uh, a few colleges are opening. Uh, your college will be opening here soon. I'm moving my son into his college this weekend. It's all happening. Yes. So, yeah. Busy, busy time. Yes, which is probably why I've not been doing a whole lot heck of a lot of movie watching and stuff i've watched a few things i've been kind of on a euro spy kick i've been reading this book called the euro spy guide yes and, i have noted all of uh, the various posts for yes euro spy films that you have dug up out of the trenches <laughs> yep 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 uh it's an interesting book it's just a kind of just written by a couple fans and they're kind of uh a brief synopsis and review of, of films. And so as I'm going through anything that actually sounds like it would be kind of fun and interesting, I make a note of it and then go see if I can find it. <laughs> and I, I have found a few. So yeah, I've, I've managed to watch a few films and yep, it's a good time. I, I enjoy the genre. They, some of them can be a lot of fun. They do kind of slag on Danger Death Ray, which I don't didn't really appreciate. But <laughs> it's not that I... It's kind of like, I agree with their points, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't be talked out of liking something that you like. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, you can agree with their points and go, but it's still awesome. <laughs> yeah. I also haven't had as much uh, TV time because my, my wife is desperately trying to get through like three years of uh, independent film uh, documentaries. Oh, really? Uh, that we have piled up on the DVR that we're trying to get through before we finally cut the damn satellite out uh -huh. of our life. So we are, we are finally looking to, quote-unquote, cut the cord. We've got prices on all the streaming services and everything, and, yeah, it'll cost us about half of what we're currently paying for the damn satellite. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, interestingly enough, I caught, uh, and I'm not going to quote this very properly, but I did see a news article today that said something to the effect of um, broadcast TV and cable television viewing has now dipped below 50% of the market share. Wow. So there you go. Broadcast is even more like 20%. Yeah. Oh, I imagine. Yeah. It, it, anyone other than like my mom, I'm no, I don't know anyone that... <laughs> Yeah, no, I thought I was late to cutting the cord when I cut it like two years ago. I've I've been wanting to do it for years. I, sure. I could have cut it easily, but it was uh, my 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 wife was the holdout trying to make sure she could watch all the shows she wants to watch, and so now all the things that we've recorded over the years and never had time to watch, we're trying to burn through. So I I'm interested. It's it's kind of one of these things that. You know, some of these documentaries are interesting, mm -hmm. but to me, they were interesting if we caught them. I don't have like this need to actually watch every single one of them. <laughs> so right. I'm usually just sort of, I'm reading on the couch while she's watching and burning through one or two. <laughs> so yeah, so I've had to share the TV time. So haven't haven't watched as much as I normally would. Heaven forbid you give time to others. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched a little bit of Strange New Worlds. I have. I'm still behind. I have not watched the finale yet. 
And, and you know what? You might as well wait and savor because with the uh, with the ongoing um, issues related to the strikes. Oh yeah, that's what I hear. It could be as late as 2025 before we get a, a new season. Yeah, while while season three has been greenlit before season two aired, much like the other way around for two before one aired, um, they'll make it. But yeah, you got to have the writers and the actors back. Otherwise, you can't do anything. I haven't been as enamored with this second season. I think I've we've talked about it a little bit before. It's still some of the best Trek that we've had in decades, mm-hmm. in my opinion. But yeah, that first season I thought just hit it out of the park. And this year, it's been okay. It's had its highlights. There's some. There's been some amazing acting. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of the stories have been have been interesting and and, and good. Uh, you know, Star Trek has always done a good courtroom drama. Oh yeah, that that goes all the way back to TOS. There was some phenomenal acting in the episode. Uh, I don't know the title uh, where they uh, everyone keeps forgetting. They go to sleep and they forget everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Great acting in that. Uh, actually, the supporting cast, the, the the guy that was helping him down on the planet, I thought he was amazing. I was really impressed with him. Uh, trying to think what other standouts. Uh, the uh, crossover with Lower Decks. I think you got to be a Lower Decks fan to enjoy that because I did not. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 yeah, and I know you've always, you've been a lot harder on Lower Decks than I am. I am a Lower Decks fan. I enjoy it rather quite a bit. I, I, I think it actually knows its place and, and resides in it well. So I was very worried about this episode and I still... Uh, you might not have liked it as much because it had the lower decks thing, but considering they took what is a cartoon comedy and paired that with what's supposed to be serious drama, and man, I thought they actually did a fantastic job pulling it off. I mean, is it my favorite episode of the season? No, it, it is not. Uh, but I still thought it was incredibly amusing and still managed to fit with what they were trying to accomplish and just at the opportunity to see uh, uh um its own little uh reverence like the 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 way that the the characters from lower decks revered the crew of the enterprise mm-hmm. and, and then just gave them little ego boosts here and there was really kind of fun yeah yeah, I just, uh, I don't find the style of, I don't know if we should want to call it writing, acting, or whatever that that's Lower Decks, where everything is just so rapid fire. Mm-hmm. Nothing is spoken. It's all in double time. And you got the actual actors doing that as characters in this live action. And they're just talking really fast. It, yeah. It's like watching the... It's like going back to old Speed Racer cartoons. A little. A little. <laughs> and I just, I don't care for that. I just... <laughs> and, and I get get your point uh, that the, the animated characters, even in live action, are now still kind of doing that rapid su- succession kind of thing because they got to get their joke in. Yeah. And, and, and I felt some of that, but it, the way that it paced off of the uh, other crew was... a. Uh, it was kind of fun. They're in; these are the future people, and yet they looked ridiculous to the crew. The crew of the Enterprise, and I don't know. I I, I kind of dug it. <laughs> there was a few things that I that that made me at least grin uh, when they were looking at the the com badges. Yes, and they're like, "Look!" And he just he just push it here, and like. The flippy thing is the best part. <laughs> You're talking yeah. about their own communicators. Yeah, yeah. As Pike, Pike and Number One are having a conversation yeah. in the hallway. No, no flipping. The flipping's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those those were the nice little digs that 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 made it a lot of fun. No, I, not the greatest episode in the world, but um, I, if anything, for this season, um, it's just the risks being taken. They could go horribly wrong. Now, this one was not your cup of tea, but it wasn't terrible either. So 
that's a bit that's a huge risk and it still worked and for those that liked lower decks too it was a lot of fun well then speaking of risks let's talk about the musical yes. episode that's subspace huge... rhapsody yes yeah, subspace rhapsody awesome title by the way awesome yeah, title brilliant title i absolutely love the idea of this I, I, I came away thinking I would have never thought Star Trek the musical would work. Right. But now it's kind of like all I ever want. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I went into that episode, too, because I am not a big musical guy. I don't uh, don't tend to care for them. Um, I was one impressed. First, the music was good. Like the songs were actually pretty decent, um, but they were also they sang what they were doing. Like, all, it just all of a sudden started rhyming and, and, and it had a flow to it and might have a dance number involved and they can't help themselves. And they don't even want to be doing it, but they're, they're doing it. And then whether it's a combination of which actors were actually excited to be doing it, like I know, um, and I, forgive me, I don't know everybody's real name, the uh, La, La on, um, mm-hmm. that actress lo- loves musicals and wanted to do ah. a musical. <laughs> and, and that came through even while she was doing it. Whereas Anson Mount, I don't know how musical he is, but whether it was him beat fighting it a little bit or just that it was appropriate that Pike might fight it. Um, you felt that even in those sequences where, okay, Captain Pike's going to sing, but it, you can see it in his face. He doesn't want to do it. Yes. But he can't help himself when the moment actually comes and he breaks down, he ends up starting to sing. And i uh, like, it was, bo- it was hysterical. It was, it was, the music was good. It was a huge risk and I thought it paid off big time. I, I agree. I thought the music sounded really good and it, it was looked great. I love the, you know, the dance routines, whatever. The only problem is, is that in the end though, none of the songs really had any stickiness to them. I mean, as soon as I was done with the episode, I was trying to think the big enterprise number. And I'm thinking, I, I have no, I, I don't remember any of the lyrics. Right, yeah, no, I and I, I had a little bit of the, that problem too, but I bet you a second watch and it probably starts setting it. Maybe, maybe. I just it seems like I should be coming away humming one of those songs right. for like the next week, and I, I they was completely gone from my head the moment I, the show stopped. Uh, I'm dying to spoil more of this, but th- one of the things that I would love to spoil in a conversation is also one of the hugest payoffs, I think. Um, Klingons. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> that was kind of... <laughs> that was just kind of... Let's just throw it to the wall, see if it sticks. Yeah, you know, like, uh, I couldn't... I was both... I was totally into the thing and also just laughing my ass off. Cause, well, and they played it right by keeping it very short. It was a sure. joke. It, it was. was just a it was a quick one liner effectively. Right. No, but it was well placed. It was at the right moment and, and it it's basically when we're wrapping things up cuz you just figure they'd end up in war if the killing gods had to sing all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I I had a lot of fun with it. That's probably the most divisive that I've apparently from what I've read online and everything. I mean, there is it's pretty much down the middle. It's either love it or hate it. Right. <laughs> no. Um. And, and unlike you, like I, I loved this season honestly. Um. And looking forward to you catching the season finale. Um. Uh, and it's just a shame. It's going to be so long before we get season three yeah yeah it is it's it's gonna feel like a little bit of a desert there for a little while uh, it, well and it starts cropping up concerns because as the strikes play themselves out when when they do wrap up because it will um they'll all figure it out at some point but does that change anything going into the actual production of third season 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what happens, I'm assuming everyone would be contractually obligated to come back. Certainly, but, and this seems like a group of folks that actually enjoy it. It's part of what works. It, it, everything I've read, every interview I've seen, this group of people playing these characters for Star Trek love doing it. I'm really looking forward to these actors starting to do the convention circuits, too. I was just thinking about that. Uh, re- sort of tangentially related, I suppose, but I... I'm just really looking forward to them doing the uh, the the festival or the uh, convention circuits to hear the stories. I yeah, mean, you're right. I think they they look like they're having a ball. I really want to see them come to the conventions and confirm that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you want to hear the things that you don't hear. Mm-hmm. Uh, an interview is an interview, but uh, if they can just tell their anecdotes, would be fun. Yes. Uh, the actress that plays the young Uhura. You know, I got a chance to to meet and talk to Nichelle Nichols at some length uh, years ago. And while I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I, I know her or anything, uh, after speaking to her, uh, being in the same room with her, talking about to her about her career and all the things that she's done, and then looking at this uh, young actress as, as she portrays the character... Mm. I really think Nichols would be incredibly proud to have this woman taking over the mantle of Uhura. No, absolutely. Uh, it, it's getting a chance to see some depth to a character that she lovingly portrayed, but because it just wasn't written that way in the 60s, you didn't get the opportunity. So, yeah, having an actual family backstory, um, having not even necessarily being interested in Starfleet it went that way because it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time that I, that that we were never going to get out of uh, the original version yeah having a character with interests and 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 everything which and and just the way she portrays her uh and the fact that you know she can sing and dance <laughs> which Michelle Nichols Nichols was quite famous for as well uh yeah it, I She's an actress that is going to go on and do fantastic things in her career as well, I think. No, absolutely. And the uh, episode that you were trying to remember was called Lost in Translation. And it, it, that because that one sticks in mind, too, because that's Uhura m- meeting Kirk for the first time. And it also has that moment at the end of the thing where Kirk meets Spock for the first time. Yeah. Um, which... It, it, it's kind of a big deal. It, it, they, they tried to make it as subtle as possible, but that's that's a moment for for Star Trek. Yeah, uh, but, oh, absolutely. But yeah, from your perspective and knowing uh, some of the back uh, background between the actual actors for the original series and through the movies, um, for Nichelle Nichols to see if she could have had the opportunity to see this actress play Uhura and watch Uhura kind of own Kirk a little bit through that, that would have probably been a lot of fun. <laughs> no, absolutely. And uh, you mentioned the Kirk here in Strange New Worlds. I still feel like they are trying really hard to ingratiate this Kirk on us. I really think they maybe have a long game of rebooting the original series there's a lot of talk about that and you know this guy keeps showing up on the enterprise (laughs) and we've now heard that he's been promoted to first officer in the farragut so it's like yeah they're setting him up for to to be the youngest captain and you know they, they 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 know we can only get a few years out of pike right uh, before he has to go off and do his thing that he knows he has to do, and we know how it all turns out, they're, they're setting ever, uh, Paul Wesley, right, as yep. the actor? Yep. They're setting him up to take over and to reboot the series with this, uh, just in case. If it, if this show has the longevity, right. that's what they're setting up for. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. I'm kind of hoping we just don't get there. Not that I would be it would be problematic. It's just, I don't want to revisit all of the original series. Um, 
And, and that was actually a topic when we ever we got around to talking about Strange New Worlds again anyways, is I know one of your struggles with Star Trek has been whether or not you feel it's a represent any of the new shows, if they're a representation of what you feel Star Trek is. And I am, as I have my son trying to watch the original series, which it's fun watching a 14 year old try to absorb something from the sixties. <laughs> um, and, and I watch him do it and, and, and he's actually, he's in it. He, but he'll have conversations with me after the fact, like we actually caught the episode with the Gorn and I haven't actually seen that one in years and didn't realize just how much of it, how much story there is before we actually have the battle in the arena, which is the title of the episode. Um, by the time you actually get to the battle with the Gorn, there's a whole lot of story beforehand. Watch this season finale and you'll see actually that actually dovetail nicely into the pre-story of arena uh, before we see the really stupid looking gore. <laughs> I mean, okay. <laughs> but but what I was thinking about as like, okay, this is, you're not feeling all of this season, but if we look long and hard at any Star Trek series, it's not all good. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's terrible in some cases. No, the entire, I mean, my God, the, the, the entire third season of TOS is often cringe worthy <laughs> yeah so a, 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 as i'm doing this i'm reminded okay we all bring to the table a lot of baggage uh but we all have to also have that mindset go back to the thing that you that made you love it rewatch it and find out that it wasn't all that that at the time it's all about the where your head is at when you go into this so right with me super stoked for Strange New Worlds, they almost can't do wrong for me. Because <laughs> this, it's quickly starting to even go, this, this could run against uh, Next Gen for me. Well, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's definitely up there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm having a great time. So I'm just really sad. It's going to probably be way over a year before I see it again. Yep. All right, well, let's leave Trek behind and move into another uh, sci-fi franchise here. We'll take a break, listen to a promo for another podcast. And when we return, we're going to look at Japan's 2010 live-action version of Space Battleship Yamato. If you like small town mystery, crazy news, and wild history, then the Florida Men on Florida Man podcast is for you. Each week, Josh Mills and Wayne McCarty bring you the absolute best Florida has to offer. So if you're looking for a show that's safe for the family, but funny enough to help you escape everyday life, then listen to the Florida Men on Florida Man podcast. That's Florida Men, plural, on Florida Man podcast. <laughs> ヤマト発信。大切な人を失ったのはあなただけじゃないのね。俺はその思いを信じる。あ、大変だ。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがと
or Gamelons, if you're going by the Star Blazers, mm-hmm. uh, who have attacked the Earth with radioactive planet bombs. After receiving plans f- from the planet Iskandar for a new faster-than-light engine, the crew of the Yamato embarks on a journey to the planet Iskandar to retrieve technology that can cleanse Earth of its radiation and save the human race. This series was imported and dubbed and slightly edited to the United States as Star Blazers in 1979. The 2010 live-action film follows a similar premise to the original anime, but incorporates story elements from a 1978 film sequel, Farewell to Space Battleship Yamato, particularly in the climax of the film. The crew of the Yamato, led by Captain Juzi Okita and a young officer named Susumu Kodai, embarks on the dangerous journey to Iskandar to retrieve technology to save humanity. The film alters some characters from the anime, including changing Yuki from a nurse and radar operator to making her an ace fighter pilot, as well as gender swapping a couple roles, including Dr. Sato. Yes, I am trying my best to pronounce some of the (laughs) names here. I have them all like phonetically spelled out. (laughs) I I do believe that technically when uh, you're referencing someone, you actually say last name first. Yes. I kind of had a, a discussion with myself. I was like, do I want to sound pretentious or just a, like a dumb American? <laughs> so I'm kind of going with my strength. <laughs> <laughs> and going just as you will find the, the name written. Because I just think that's the way people hear. If you're reading it on Wiki or reading a credit, that's how you're going to read it. You're in the United States. Just know we mean one. There was a, several of the actors that were involved in the original anime had some uh, dealings with this film. Uh, Kenichi o- Ogata did the voice of Analyzer. Oh, very cool. I uh, thought I recognized Analyzer. Yeah, it was it was right from the uh, anime. Yeah, Masato Ibo as Desla, leader of the evil side of the Gamelons, or Gamelos. Uh, it, that voice actor came back to, uh, to do it here in the film, as well as the actress uh, Moyiki Oeda, who did the Iskandar in this film, who originally uh, did Starsha. Okay. Who was, of course, leader of the good side. And the uh, narrator, Esawa Sasaki, as the narrator, he sang the original anime theme and maybe possibly was the narrator. I don't recall if there was a narrator in the original (laughs) Japanese anime. I know there was one in Star Blazers, and that was obviously a different... uh, voice actor yeah no their their narration was pretty typical and actually that was another voice that i had thought i had heard before it's definitely one as soon as it comes on in the film you're like man that stirs something i've heard that yeah exactly. <laughs> that voice but yeah he actually uh, he definitely sang the original theme from the uh the original what 74 anime wow that's pretty cool no, you did it. You did good. I didn't even know some of those facts. So that that's actually pretty cool. We both grew up watching Star Blazers. Yes. I think at some point we each dialed into the local UHF 64 mm-hmm. channel. Uh, probably was WIII yep. back at the day. W-I-I-I. Uh, and caught Star Blazers. I think that was the first place I probably uh, saw this. I know that's where I saw it too. I got older, it's when I discovered, oh, wait, this is Japanese, and wait, there's Japanese versions, and that's, Mm -hmm. you know, you collect the... I had the film versions of the stories. I I never saw the... I don't think I ever saw any of the the original Japanese series, but I I do know I've... uh, I used to own, on VHS, the three original... or the main uh, three original film versions Mm -hmm. of the story. And the first film story was, uh, or the first film was just the series edited together into film form. Yeah. So yeah, this is a series that has been with us for a long time. And it's one of these things that I think I could have watched this when I was a kid and then never watched it again. And I'd still remember it. Oh, wow. There is something special about Star Blazers that it just sticks in your head and will not let go. I mean, to this day, the, 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 I actually still liken uh, the the second season of Enterprise as to stealing the Iskandar story 
of Star Blazer stat slash space battleship Yamato. The the notion of a of an alien race threatening the Earth and a soul ship has to venture out to uh, to find the resolution in order to save humanity. I mean that that was cut right out of Star Blazers. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, uh, you you it, can watch this once and it'll stick with you forever. There are scenes to this day I can just close in my eyes. I can see some of them. There may be a little bit to do with the US uh version of Star Blazers having the theme song that oh, yeah. will live in your head rent free <laughs> your entire life. <laughs> space we're leaving mother earth to save the human race our star blazers so yeah we got our version with our with english words but that song it came from the original the music, the I music. actually thought, think that was very cool. The music is actually from the original, but then, of course, they someone wrote English words that do not translate. It's not a direct translation right. of anything from the Japanese, but they wrote it to the tune. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's actually very cool. No, and it's actually one of the things that um, was very, I was very pleasantly surprised for the live action film is the translation of that music right over to the movie. You can't help, but you're sitting in that movie, and the first time you hear that music, <laughs> you're just like, <sighs> spine tingles. <laughs> you get the goosebumps. It, it, it's actually a, 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 both a, a like and a dislike for the movie, because watching even the Japanese versions, uh, the, the space battleship Yamato, the animated stuff, um, having watched that, watched Star Blazers, and then Japanese actually latched on to calling it Star Blazers when they did a remake series uh, called uh, Star Blazers 2199. Straight Japanese, um, but they titled it Star Blazers. It's the space battleship Yamato. The ship is called the Yamato in the series, and it's the crew, it's Kodai, it's Yuki, and all that. But they still use they use the Star Blazer name, which interesting. I didn't know that. I've only seen it as Space Battleship Yamato twenty one ninety nine. I thought. Oh no no no! I'm like even looking at it on screen right now. You can pick it. It's called uh, yeah. It's Star Blazers Space Battleship Yamato twenty one ninety nine. Hmm. Are you sure that's not something that was done for U.S. markets? I, I can't say for certain, but I've seen okay. Star Blazers like branded on everything related to the twenty one ninety nine series. So, all right, no, you could be right. I, I certainly uh, wouldn't. Uh, right down to it. the model kits that you can buy. <laughs> right, yeah, which I have actually a couple. There's uh, unassembled. <laughs> I have a Yamato, uh, completely unassembled. Uh, one of these days, I'll get to it. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I have one that sits on my shelf at work that's finished and electronic and all of that. And then, oh, fancy. Yeah, and then I, to this day, I have this dream. I, I have same-scale models of both the space battleship and the original battleship, and I want to build them side-by-side. Interesting. So that I get the same paint schemes and all that. It'd be very cool if they if if they're the same scale. They are. They're the exact same ah, scale. Ah, very cool. Yeah. yeah. So, dying to do that someday. I've even got a model of the. Uh, I think it's supposed to be like the future Yamato. What was it? Twenty one ninety nine or something. No, it was. Tw- there was uh, a uh, twenty five something. Yeah, there was there was an attempt to do a new anime, mm-hmm. which took place in the far future but it fell into a lot of big uh, legal hassles as far as uh, trademark and copyrights and i think maybe two or three episodes were created before it was uh canned i've seen but clips some- of something but i don't know that it ever finished yeah no i've never seen actual uh footage from it but somehow or another someone managed to make a model of the ship yeah and I have that. Of course, all the instructions are in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. 
But uh, just getting back to the the music part, um, having seen all the other content, um, and, and I don't know, I, I I don't think it's our copy or anything, but the music all seemed more muted than the other versions I have ever seen. Like uh, there are moments while we watch this film where I just want the I want the music to just come up big and strong. And it just sits there in the back. <laughs> and mm, Oh, interesting. And, and, and it, I don't know. Like I said, I don't think it has anything to do with the copy. I think it just literally, that's how they cut this. And they did the sound editing. And there was something just a little off for it for me. I, 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 I thought didn't the, notice that. That's, that's interesting. I also noticed that about um, the sound effects. They used a lot of similar sound effects that were used for the animated stuff. But either it was muted a lot of the time or reduced. Like when they set off the wave motion gun, which is a huge deal when you do that. And in the animated stuff, that... That had a very distinct sound with a huge... It You could even hear the animal sounds that they've incorporated because it had like a, a horse's whinny to it. Yeah. A, as it as it spiraled out of the barrel and, and, and blew up whatever it hit. Um, and I could detect a little of that, but they just... They muted it a little bit. And there were scenes on the bridge where it would be dead quiet at times and you didn't have the little boot beeps and boops and stuff that were normally played during the cartoon. They're, they were missing in the live action. I'm like, I thought that was a missed opportunity on their part. Sound design is always something that can um, make or break a film sometimes. And I won't say that it does one way or the other on this film. So maybe it's, it, it's just, it's there, but just not there enough for you yeah um, no i i did notice there was moments where it's just like boy it's quiet yeah and when when you're thinking i mean granted you know what the original anime had these moments too i mean sure. entire episodes would go on and it's just nothing's happening <laughs> <laughs> why are they just talking you know um and i feel like this film has some moments like this too and it's like aren't you in the middle of a battle <laughs> <laughs> and and they're talking and there's nothing going on and there's no sound and it's like sh- sh- it's just something missing here <laughs> and, and, and I'm just going to jump off from that point right there it's the one thing that stops me from loving this outright um, it's that it was so lovingly translated from the material I mean it made some it made some choices and honestly, like things with uh, the Gamelas, making them far more alien than we were aware of was actually a choice I liked. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. I actually rather enjoyed that they decided that an alien species would be completely and totally alien. And and, and I really kind of dug that element. So even though they weren't the Gamelons that I knew and loved and we didn't get our fair-haired, cape-wearing... Uh, what, what was his name in the Star Blazers series? Uh, Deslock. Deslock. Uh, I, 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 that's what I wanted to say and I wouldn't latch onto it. But Deslock, yeah. We didn't get our pretty boy Deslock in there, but there was actually a moment um, when... The, their version of Desla is making essentially a holographic projection of himself on the bridge. And at one point, the the body shape does kind of morph into Deslock. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I that was that. cool. That was super yeah. cool. But because this parallel tried to parallel and way too much condense the entirety of the Escandera story into a two hour and change movie. Um, it didn't take opportunities to mature it um, where I thought it could. And you kind of hit on it a little bit. We're, we're at the end of the film. Um, the Gamelas have been essentially wiped out, but they're going to, in their last remaining bit of uh, presence in our work, in our universe, 
they're going to wipe out Earth. And they've got their last big weapon, and it's it's making its way. They're in orbit. And mm-hmm. it's making its way. And I swear the, the final scenes of this are like 20 minutes long. Yes. While we're saying goodbye to everybody. <laughs> Isn't the Earth just gone by the time you get around to doing anything? Yeah, there there is absolutely no agency among them. <laughs> no. That, although this is it's going to destroy the Earth. Well, let's 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 talk about this. <laughs> let's say our goodbyes. Let's hug and yeah. I love you. I love you too. And yeah, you know, it was honor. It was great. I'm like, um, there's a big gun uh, <laughs> pointing at the Earth. Gi- giant <laughs> torpedo heading. The- yeah down and well yeah and then they even build in some stuff where it just didn't make sense like he's having Kodai's having his big moment with Yuki at the end saying goodbye professing their love he even has to stun her to to get her to go and that's the part that drives me crazy she hung back everybody else already took off and she wants to be there with him um which is also already incredibly selfish because she has to go yeah, she's the linchpin of saving Earth. <laughs> right. She doesn't hit ground. Earth's gone anyway. So she has to go. So this is already uber selfish moment in what's supposed to not be selfish. But then um, I know him as Venture. I can't, I can't remember what they called him. Shima, I think. Shima. Thank you. Shima. Shima comes out of nowhere to collect Yuki. Mm-hmm. Nobody called him back. Uh <laughs> <laughs> he just kind of knew, because cause this script said so. <laughs> well, I I saw that, and I'm thinking, I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, why would he, oh, because Yuki wasn't with him. Obviously, they got to the shuttle, and Yuki wasn't there, so. So he came back. Hey. He naturally came back to get her. Sure, although we didn't exactly have a scene where we explained why Yuki would be important to anybody else that needs to know. I mean. Really, at that stage, Kodai and Yuki are the only one that knows that Yuki has to go home. (laughs) We can only assume that they told the crew. (laughs) Sure, but seeing as how we spent a good half hour telling the crew all sorts of stuff. (laughs) Well, that was the longest damn speech. (laughs) Yeah. And, and that, that was my only, that's my one thing that held me back from loving it. I mean, I mean, there are times, though, that even the CGI looks a little dated already. Oh, really? I didn't really, uh, I don't see it. I didn't think much of, of, of that. I thought it all looked pretty good. There was a few moments where I felt like, I don't know if you'd call it it was dated or if it was just the fact the design just, maybe maybe what you're talking about is there are times where I feel like, I'm watching a CGI cartoon and not a CGI live action. Right. And this is where I can love and hate the choice of making them so much more alien. It's that when the crystalline version of themselves were actually joined with a physical body, um, it was an opportunity to cookie cutter all of those bodies. They, there was no distinction. So when you're having a big battle where you're actually getting the gamelas in a physical form fighting... Well, they're the, all exactly the exact same thing, so it feels cheap. Um, yeah. There's that, um, and then there are times when we're on the bridge where you even commented, it's a little quiet. Um, you're on the bridge, and there's action going on, and it really feels like you should cut away to something happening outside the ship for reference, and we don't. And that's where I wonder if either they didn't have the budget to make it or or what. But there might be something to it. I read some trivia and, you know, it's online and it's I've likely translated from Japanese. So, I mean, take all of it as as you will, mm. with a little bit of grain of salt and everything. Uh, supposedly, the film was pretty much complete and everything. And then the actor... That played Kodai, uh, Takuya Kimura. Mm-hmm. I think that he saw he saw some film, and I don't remember what it was. And he was so impressed with it, he's like, "We need to up the effects for this." And to make sure that they don't go over budget, he like worked for scale. Oh, did he? 
so they could put the money into the effects budget so they could up the effects a little bit. But I'm still wondering if there might have been some... If that's true, that's awesome. But there may have still been, okay, this is the best we can do for this price. Right. To which, uh, which I'll go back to the loving part, the ship was beautiful. <laughs> I thought it looked great. It looked fantastic. <laughs> and I am... I am in love with this ship the way that I am love in love with the Enterprise. Uh, I this is an icon for me. I love this thing. The it it seems so simple. The concept of converting an actual naval vessel into a spacefaring vehicle just seems right somehow. <laughs> Even if. It's completely ridiculous. Oh no, it's it still feels right. Yes. Ridiculous. But it just see it just fits. It it's like a warm glove on a cold day. It's just right. You just yes. love it. <laughs> no, I'm I'm with you. It is one of my favorite spaceship designs. Mm-hmm. I mean the Enterprise and I waffle between TOS and like Enterprise A, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the Enterprise will always be the top of the list for me. But yeah, the, the Yamato or Argo, I, yeah, there is something just so... Maybe it's because it's so different. There's not another spaceship in an anime or comic or movie that looks like it. Right. Oh, no, and maybe, and, it, and it, it was distinctive amongst its brethren, like even uh, because there was a Space Force... Uh, before there was the Yamato and the fact that when they they put the technology that they had gotten from Iskandar into the Yamato, even though it shared some characteristics as far as like having cannons and all of that, it just looked better than everything mm-hmm. else. It's just beautiful. I love that ship. Yeah. Now you mentioned something about this film being um abridged effectively yes you know they 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 had to jam a lot into two hours they took a series that ran uh, i forget how many episodes it was but an entire episode a a story that supposedly lasted a year in the original anime yeah and they condensed it into a film that the adventure takes a few days (laughs) i i feel like the story loses something by being so abridged by it just being, okay, we did this in a week. It feels, it takes a little something away it, from the story. I think it, it absolutely does. It's one of those that again, in this day and age with the technology that's available with streaming being the way that it is, you'd love to see them do a live action series. Yeah, that would actually take the entire year. I mean, they go to the trouble of, in the story, in this film, of saying that uh, scientists say that, you know, human races maybe got a year and it'll, and Earth will be uninhabitable. Maybe less, they say. But then the adventures of the Yamato take place in just a couple of days. You, you can't help but thinking, well, if they fail, they'll have, maybe they can try something else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because they've got a year. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, and they, they, they've still got the schematics. They could possibly build another ship and all that fun stuff. But Right. That, and you've brought something up there that I wanted to make sure that we touched on is one of the changes that it did with this is like in the, the cartoon series, Iskandar was a definite, like, like with Starsha and all, they had a destination. She did have a cure. All of that that just had to get to her. In this case, the choice to say that it was a gamble that they would get anything at all out of mm-hmm. this. I'm wondering what drove that particular choice. <laughs> yeah, that was real interesting. I'm not sure. Other than maybe, is it just a? Uh... And we talked a little bit about this before we started recording. The the fact that the original creators of the anime chose the Yamato. Yeah. And there is a fervor, apparently, (laughs) amongst the Japanese 
about this ship that was, you know, a uh, the flagship of the fleet for a time before it was sunk. It has this mystique about it that even though they were, I guess, you know, you know on the losing side of the last world war, there is a certain, um, I'm not sure how to put it. There's an th- honor to it all. Yeah. It, it, they, there's definitely an honor to this, to this vessel. And it's kind of the, um, even though it kind of represents a lost cause and that's maybe makes it even more special. So maybe incorporating that, the idea of like this, this could be all, a, a, a fool's errand, but we're going to do it proudly makes it more special somehow. And, and we can't possibly fully understand it. It's cultural. Um, yeah, I this, I definitely think there is a sort of lost in translation uh, when it comes to the themes on some of this. No, absolutely. We can't possibly know that side. We, we just can't. We don't have that perspective. But because that perspective does exist within the Japanese culture. You slap your motto on anything and it's going to get some reverence. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so to actually say that you have actually resurrected the actual Yamato and put it back into service for the glory of humanity, it's going to elevate it a tad. <laughs> <laughs> went back i've actually watched a little bit of the old star blazers i i grabbed it from the library i remembered a lot of it and then a lot of it i forgot i didn't remember that they actually was called the yamato it was the yamato mm-hmm. uh in the original in the star blazers cartoon and then they renamed it argo yeah and i don't know why i they they gave a reason in the speech okita uh or it wasn't Okita of uh, what Captain um, I forget the captain's name in Star Blazers. He gave a speech and then gave a reason why the, they were going to change the name to to, to the Argo. But um, it just it actually surprised me a little bit that it did start out as the Yamato. Yeah, it's been a bit, but now that you mention it, I think I recall that too because they did acknowledge that it was an old battleship from. And that, that's what they chose. That, that's what was the whole mystique, too, is they were able to, because humanity has gone underground, the ship is half, it is the ocean's boiled away. Um, mm-hmm. It's sitting there exposed, but the underside of it is completely underground still. So that's, they could work on it in secret. So right. acknowledging that it was the, actually a real ship did come up. The movie had a lot of the touchstones that were in this the series. Yes. Uh, you know, the the missile coming aimed at Yamato, which forces him to take off uh, earlier than expected, and to use the wave motion gun, mm-hmm. and the the explosion, and the the where's Yamato, and it comes out of the clouds. I mean, that's all right out of the the original anime, and uh, there was a few other touchstones. Um, there was one that I was expecting them to... El- they they set a course to make it more, but I remember it hitting harder in the animated stuff than in this, which was the notion when they're about to be out of range of communication. Yes, yeah. Everybody gets a turn to, to talk to their family one last time before they leave the solar system and are out of touch. And I remember in the animated stuff that... It was heart wrenching watching Kodai slash Wildstar um, sit there and have no one to talk to. Yeah, the the they really abbreviated that too. I mean, we got maybe like thirty seconds of him sitting in the communication booth, and something else. Uh, time's up, and something else is going on. Wow. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, and it was supposed to be that moment to bridge. Um, who he is related to the captain because the captain was in the same situation. He could talk to somebody, but he had nobody to talk to. So mm-hmm. he too sat in the uh, the communications bay with nothing to do. Um, and that, if I remember correctly, in the animated, that's when there was at least a a first bonding moment between the two, and we didn't do that in this. 
Let's talk a little bit about the characters sure. that, uh, and, and compare them to you know the original anime and everything. What do you think of uh, their version of Kodai? The actor was great for it. Uh, it had the right look, had, had the right feel. Um, again, I think it just he was hindered by the whole having to crunch this all down. They they played up too much that whole. I'm the rebel. I'm going to save everybody. I can't understand why you would let my brother die. All all of that stuff until he's till we rush to a moment where he has to make a life and death decision and then oh the light bulb comes on. We wrestled with that longer through the series and, and it wasn't so overt his uh his his nature to be kind of rebellious. He kind of towed the line for the most part but would have those moments where he didn't care for the captain and yeah. this got rushed but otherwise he was did a great job yeah in the original story i remember i'm i'm pretty sure there was, was at least an episode or, or two where it's finally explained that his brother sacrificed himself mm-hmm. it was his choice he did it in this film i don't think we ever got that kind of resolution no no uh, it, yeah it, it was just at no point was that conversation had that he volunteered to save. So that's the the one thing that they saved from that but didn't punch correctly because they didn't have the full conversation is that notion somebody had to come back. Because mm-hmm. the captain mentioned that at one point, but not with the emotional weight that your brother is why right. somebody got to come back. Uh, Yuki is definitely probably the biggest change. Yes. Uh, I, I, there is no comparison uh, with the original story, uh, the original character. I really think it's apples and oranges. She shares a name, and that's about it. <laughs> well, yeah, and because this is supposed to be the love interest, and they've chose, chosen to take this completely different route, um, we didn't get enough time and character development. And to make the leap from um, you're an annoyance to I'm in love with you deeply. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that really comes out of nowhere in this film. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of those itchy parts where it holds me back from loving it. Sonata, the chief science officer, I kind of liked his sort of... Um, he was Mr. Spock even in the original. He was. <laughs> I mean, he very, very kind of emotionalist, very pragmatic uh and i think the this actor actually did a really good job of kind of conveying that as well no uh, he carried that character well and despite the fact we didn't get some of the more memorable stuff uh with his character from from star blazers and all that because i can still to this day remember the scene where he he tells wild star to take his arms and legs off no oh, right because they were bionic or Yes, he, he had Electronic, lost them whatever. At, at one point, probably due to the radiation and, mm. and all. And we didn't get that, but they did. That actor and this portrayal did capture that sense of self sacrifice. That uh, yes, absolutely, because he makes this is the, the one of the jumps where they they pull in something from the uh, the sequel film and eventual uh, sequel series, second season, I should say, mm-hmm. of the uh, of the anime is they have to, uh, he and uh, Space Commando uh, Sato uh, sacrifice themselves to plant bombs at the core of, uh, in the in the original series, yeah. it was the uh, Common Empire's uh, battleship. Yep. And they, they do that in this film here, which was still, I thought, a really powerful and well-done moment and scene. It was, yeah. Him and... Um, and you're gonna, Sato. Sato. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm thinking of the um, the guy that sacrificed himself um, before the Marine guy. That's Sato. That's Sonata Sato is the yes. Okay. Sonata is the science officer. Sonata, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sato is the uh, the space commando. Yeah, but Marine. Yeah, the, yeah. No, so Sato's sacrifice while Sonato um, is doing his thing. That that whole sequence was amazing. Yeah, it pulls from a completely different story, but wow, it was powerful then, it's powerful now. Dr. Sato, I, I mentioned that they uh, gender-swapped, made uh, the character female, 
but I kind of like the fact that they gave her a lot of the mannerisms <laughs> of the original uh, the character. Yeah, the gender swap is about the only thing that changed. Cause <laughs> yes. She constantly had a bottle of sake with her and, <laughs> and, and the cat. <laughs> and the cat, and that sort of uh, almost kind of a... a ADHD kind of mentality where things just constantly, you know, distract distract her that she finds interesting, even though she's supposed to be focusing on something else. And uh, I, I I thought that was actually a lot of fun. No, yeah, she, they maybe played a little hard. It might be a little too on the nose. It might be what people would consider fan service, but I, I don't know. I thought it was kind of cute. Yeah, I, I dug it too. Like her, it, it, it really hit right when, uh, when Kodai is in line as a volunteer yes. and she yeah. starts just jamming her hands into his mouth right. that. I'm like that stuff straight out of the cart <laughs> yeah how are you alive let me look <laughs> yeah. uh, there's people waiting huh? oh oh <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's right we're in a hurry <laughs> oh I, I skipped over uh, Shima the navigator I thought they um, did a pretty good job casting and kind of duplicating that character sort of uh, a little worried a little hot headed um little unsure but you know willing to uh give it his all well yeah and um i don't actually remember any of that but i did kind of like the backstory between him and kodai in this where they worked together prior to help fend off the incoming uh, meteorite bombs and mm -hmm. when the situation went wrong and it jeopardized his own son. Yeah. That that's not something I recall from any of the anime. No, I'm not that I can remember. No, so I actually kind of dug that and I did really like uh to that uh they they tried to do a version of some of the more um iconic scenes from the anime like uh both of them holding the controls together <laughs> at the same time even though in this it came off a little cheesier than it did in the cartoon and mm -hmm. because again it's so abbreviated you don't get some of those moments where um even though they're friends they can be at odds with one another um, angry with one another and we didn't get any of that so right. it, it did cheapen his his role a little bit I think overall there are some um, moments that would be considered a little cheesy there, there's many times where you know something goes right and the, everyone on the crew stands up and oh yeah like yeah <laughs> that seems a little corny yeah and and, and that's that goes back to my point where I thought this was, they missed an opportunity to kind of mature it and make it more real. Uh, and yeah. it just became a live action version of the cartoon. <laughs> what do you think about Captain Okita compared to the original character? I, a fair representation, but, but again, because we sped this all up dramatically that means his time as captain was even shorter lived than, than it was before. Cause I mean, yes, yeah. he, he died before he made it home. Yeah. This, uh, they, the, the command structure of the Yamato is very similar to, uh, the Kelvin verse enterprise. A <laughs> little bit, nice little tie into our la last episode, but yes, uh, apparently you can just name whoever you want to, <laughs> to be whatever role <laughs> just by saying so out loud. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, um, he named him acting captain just after he got him out of the brig. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and there was no sense that there was any time elapse between any of that. It was like literally, okay, we're leaving the solar system. I just put you in the brig. We'll let you out to have a phone call that you can't have. And then, oh, by the way, you're now acting captain. Mm -hmm. like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah, see, that's unfortunate that it has to be so, the story has to be so abridged. Yeah. And yeah, I agree with you. This would have been so much better served as a even a short lived uh, a, a year, uh, one season uh -huh. or something where they could actually flesh some of this stuff out. 
Um, it's a big story to tell and to, to just kind of... We wanted the pretty and then we wanted the pomp and circumstance, but we didn't want any meat on that bone. Like you said, there's just some things about this that just makes you fall short of loving it. And that's coming from big fans. <laughs> I, I could look at this thing all day long. Oh, yeah. I just... Don't know if I can watch the story and without sort of like <sighs> without a few sighs. Yeah, like, and, and you hate to say that of anything when you watch it, but yeah, like I could cut it down. Like if I wanted to just go back and revisit it, I could cut it down to just all the CGI sequences. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the space battles and stuff. Yeah, because those were really cool and well done and the story kind of lacked a little although i think i feel like some of that was maybe a little even that felt abbreviated and and went by really quick oh they're coming it's a battle fire okay they're destroyed moving on right wow, yeah no really <laughs> yeah there was no sense that like that was supposed to be part of the fun in the animated stuff is that the Yamato was a surprise to um, the Gamelons in our case mm -hmm. um, because they weren't fully aware of what they were all given. So when this thing pulled out, and I know that the first in the early episodes of the series, the Gamelons all thought, oh, here's another Earth ship. Here, push one button. We'll take it out. And when that didn't happen... They were stunned, and then they were even more stunned when they found out how much firepower this thing had. And right. we didn't get that loving buildup to, to go, uh-oh, the Earthlings are a problem. <laughs> that is one of the problems with changing the, the Gamelaz uh, to this hive mind energy being race yes. versus them being actual flesh and blood with... Someone like Deslaw, who has this nonchalance, I'm the best and I don't really care. And right. oh, I guess you can go and destroy it for me if you want. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yet, oh, well, apparently this is, you know, more powerful than you would have led me to believe. Yeah. As he, to the general who's now sweating in his boots because he thinks he's going to get killed. You, you lose out on all that. You do. Yeah. But in this film, in this time frame that they're telling the story, I don't think you could, you couldn't fit that in. No, you you really couldn't, and, and, and that uh, again, that's one of those things it's missing. And it, it's funny uh, we're talking about cutting it down to the CGI, and it's too fast. I know one of the things they always it's like in it's on the poster even, um, or at least one of the posters is one of the iconic scenes where the ship is just every turret is going off on, mm -hmm. on the thing while it battles the incoming barrage. And I have seen this before and that, that sat really well with me while well, rewatching it again this time. I kind of paid attention to how long that was. It's like 15 seconds. Yeah. It's not long at all. You don't get and, and that's when it started to set in. I'm like, yeah, it, and this is where it fits very well into our time. It looks great. Yeah. But there's something missing. And yeah. that's the part that starts to make you wonder. <laughs> yeah, there's that great towards the end, you know, they're going to make the, the the final advance on Gamelus and it's you know, the entrance is is mine. There's all these little floating uh, gunner missile platforms, and so uh, Kodai is going to take his uh, Cosmos. Uh, yeah, his Cosmo Zero. Cosmo Zero down because apparently it has stealth capability. Sure. And he's just going to glide, and they actually paint the targets for the guns of the of the uh, Yamato, which is something also I don't think was ever addressed or done in the series is the idea of you have to go paint the targets in order to target the, the main turrets. Mm -hmm. And so that happens. And then he finally fires his engines, which sets off all the, uh, the gun and missile installations. 
And then the Ar- uh, the almost said the Argo. Yeah. The Yamato comes barreling down in, into the atmosphere, guns a blazing, taking all these things out, and then warps the last minute. And like you said, it's just maybe that's the scene you were talking about. It's over in a flash. You could literally turn to somebody and go, "Oh, this is going to be awesome," and turn back and it'd be gone. Right. That, that scene would be over. Yeah, that's actually a second scene, but similar kind of thing. So yeah. <laughs> You're just like, why are you rushing this? <laughs> yes, let, let, let me have a moment to really absorb and love what I'm seeing here. And is that also another thing where it's lost in translation? Is it more important for all the um, the existentialism and the uh, the drama and the, the, the personal conflicts, you know, the human... Uh, relationships is that something that is deemed a little bit more important to Japanese viewing audiences than the the flash and bang of the battle scenes yeah there could be quite a bit of that element in all that it's that we can't fully appreciate because we don't have that cultural perspective yeah I mean I'm thinking back to even like the old Kurosawa samurai films where honestly you watch those movies and they're like they can be like two hours or whatever long and there's if you really cut down to figure out how much of that film is actual like samurai sword fighting it ain't much no (laughs) brilliant films all of them i absolutely love them like seven samurai is one of just it's a favorite of mine but yeah when it comes down to actual seeing the sword play and everything it's not as much as the actual interplay between the characters so maybe yeah maybe that is just a a difference in audience very well could be the american audience really does love in an action film that's what we want we want the action so you get a space ship kind of thing we want the big grand fights we want star wars we we want those giant the ships flying everywhere everything's exploding and we could spend Go ahead and put 20 minutes of that in the middle of the film. We don't even care if it has anything to do with the film, but we like it. <laughs> yeah, this this audience member here is the kind of audience member that doesn't mind the 15-minute flyby of uh, the Enterprise in the motion picture and, you know, thinks that the best space battle that has ever been took place in Star Trek II. Right. <laughs> the Rathacon. <laughs> Which took, you know, the last third of the film. <laughs> last third of the film, and we spent a great deal of time outside the ship. We watched the two yeah. skirmish, and it's part of what we wanted. Because that's that puts you in that moment. Uh, and, and that's the part that actually, uh, if, if you were to actually live this stuff, probably wouldn't be damn near as exciting <laughs> As no, it is to true. watch from the perspective that we get. if you're just on board ship and your job doesn't even have anything to do with shooting the guns or anything, you're just the guy riding along hoping the hull doesn't blow up. Yeah, good point. I did throw this to social media and I wasn't expecting and I'm not surprised that we did not get any comments on it. So this is definitely a little bit more of a, an a, obscure film than mm-hmm. a lot of the ones we've been talking about. Other than one comment from, I believe, uh, Jay from the uh, the Rating Room podcast, who hex- who said himself, I've never even heard of this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but he said, he said, the trailer looks awesome. <laughs> so that that's all I got on the social media. I didn't have anything. Were you able to find anything in the way of reviews from the time? It, it, it's a little rough. It, it, it's a little spotty. Um I did find an interesting thing that came up. This is not so much a review as I thought I was finding, but uh, um, this is an interesting point to make about this film because in Tokyo at the time, um, the Harry Potter film had had come out or a Harry Potter because I don't know which one came out in 2010. Um, But the Harry Potter film that was out at the time got unseated by... Space Battleship Yamato, which instantly went to uh, the number one film at the time. So I think that might have been Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Yeah, so that came out in November of 2010. Okay, so that 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 sits the same time frame. So 
while that was number one in the box office at the time, Space Battleship Yamato unseated it very quickly. It doesn't really surprise me because I read that the film version of the uh, first series uh, unseated uh, Star Wars. Yeah, so... Or, or beat out Star Wars as the number one film in Japan. Yeah, so this goes to our cultural uh, conversation about this ship. Uh, the Yamato has staying power in Japan, so you put it on the screen, it's going to get it watched. Yep. <laughs> so... I did find a uh, little write-up here. Um, it, it, the I've found a couple of other ones. They're all pretty much... They're in love with the film. They actually do like it. There's this one in here particular from The Hollywood Reporter, which I actually reported on this, Maggie Lee. Um, she writes... Uh, uh, for this first ever live action version of the Japanese animated sci-fi saga that has run for 36 years on TV, <laughs> Yamazaki neither resorts to retro kitsch nor brainless action and effort effects ostentation. I'm not sure where she's going with that. This helps one overlook the perfunctory and ruthlessly condensed plot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very nice way to put that. Yeah, <laughs> which, which centers on the coming of age of its rebellious space cadet hero, Kodai. So, um, again, a lot of love for the film. Uh, I've gone through the rest of the review. It becomes more of a synopsis after that. But uh, and, and that's what most of uh, the review, even the other couple snippets that I found, which aren't really worth reading. There's no good quip out of any of them. There's no good point other than they loved it. But yeah, I got the feeling from the reviewers, they might not be as familiar with all of the content that should have fit into this in some fashion. Well, it sounds like that first one was at least They're knowledgeable aware. of the original series. Yes. No, because they even go into uh, one of the interesting things... Um, the fanatical fan base for for this would, would oftentimes uh, think it has higher cult status than Star Trek. Wow. Yeah, no, okay. if you're from Asia, Space Battleship Yamato is your Star Trek. Interesting. It, it has that kind of following. That's interesting. Well, I am still a fan of Star Blazers. Um, Absolutely. I, I will still watch this film. I have watched it a few times mm -hmm. uh, since I obtained it and because it just there are scenes there are moments that are just gorgeous to look at there are um i love the look i love hearing that 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 theme music play mm -hmm. uh it, it's used kind of mostly just in the early beginning of the film and you're like Yes, and it sends the the you know the the goosebumps and the you know get your hair out hair as it stands on on end, and yeah, and it's just after that it's just, oh, it's yeah, I like that of the way that the reviewer put it ruthlessly <laughs> <laughs> abridged. Yes, uh, no, it's been condensed a little too much. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, ruthlessly. I I like that. They they definitely wanted to try to incorporate as much as they could, but. So much other things, I think, had to get sacrificed. Would have been interesting to be involved in the writing of this screenplay to go, okay, what from... And I looked it up. It's 26 episodes makes the first ah, story arc. Go. Thank you. So the story of Iskandar takes 26 half-hour-long episodes to mm -hmm. tell. So, yeah, that's, that's a 13-hour-long movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, obviously not going to get there, but I would have loved to kind of been fly on the wall to go, okay, which of the scenes do we have to take from what has come before that we need to put into this to tell our story? So, And really, if you think about it, considering that they pulled from the second season, or, or the, at least the second film as well, you could add on to that. <laughs> so... Yeah, that would have been very hard. I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people going, oh, but I really, really wanted that. Right. <laughs> you know, as their idea was, was chopped out of the film. 
Well, if you so choose, and if you were a fan of Star Blazers and then you didn't know that there was a live-action version of the story, it is out there to be found. You can actually get this on Blu-ray if you want, and yeah, trust me, it looks gorgeous mm -hmm. on that Blu-ray. Um, I think you can find it streaming in a couple places, but you might have to spend a couple bucks. But honestly, get the Blu-ray, I think. that's it, it, It's less than 20 bucks, I think, on Amazon right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, totally worth it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And if you do watch it or if you have seen it and you know you have your own thoughts, and oh, my gosh, if there's any Japanese listeners. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> maybe, it, maybe this might attract their attention if they listen to this. Please, please. Please uh, write us and and give us your uh, your insight on this because we are desperately uh, interested. No, absolutely. Uh, correct us wherever we have lost our way. That's going to do it for this. Next time, when we come back in two weeks, our main topic is going to be another film from 2010, Tron Legacy. This was a much anticipated sequel to the original Tron film. And so we will uh, take a look at this and see if there was uh, more to it or if this was another film that just ended up looking pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to do it for this. Please, any feedback, comments, suggestions, anything, please send them our way, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or follow the link in the show notes to all our social media platforms. Be happy to hear from you. Tom, thanks very much. Uh, I don't think I had to twist your arm too much to watch this. No, again, so. no, no. But it was interesting to see again and uh, come away with a different perspective. Well, it was interesting to watch it kind of with a critical eye yes. versus just as a, a fan. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> instead of a panting fanboy. <laughs> yes. It's real. It's real. I can see it. <laughs> exactly. All right. We'll talk to everyone in a couple of weeks. Bye, everybody. See ya.